Uh, my name is Mary Caldor and I'm a professor here at the London School of Economics. And one of the research programs I've been running is called Subterranean Politics. What we've been interested in is the way in which politics that is normally at the margins, whether of both right and left, somehow has been over the last two or three years bubbling up to the surface. And this includes both political parties like UKIP, for example, or Syriza in Greece, as well as new movements like Occupy. Well, maybe before I go on to, to say what this discussion is about, I'll ask you both to say something about yourselves. Okay. Hi, my name is Hara Kuki, and I'm a historian. And I've been doing research about social movements, uh, migration, and the history of political mobilization in Europe. And I've been also contributing to national and international media about the Greek crisis and about the grassroots movements in Greece during the crisis. My name is uh, Vika Rogers. Uh, I'm half Italian, half English. Uh, I have been involved in activism in London since the Occupy movement started here. Uh, and as part of it, I've been quite involved in the international networks across Europe um, and traveling to other countries and interacting with uh, people from other countries. So the purpose, I thought, of this discussion is to think about the kind of conclusions we reached in subterranean politics and whether they've been changed as a result of the series of victory. In the study that we did, we did two studies, uh, one on discourses among activists and one on media discourses. What emerged in the first study was that Europe was somehow invisible. Activists were primarily concerned about their local and national situations and they were simply uninterested in Europe. When we probed, they had a mixture of pro and anti, but for them the key issue was local or national. Uh, when we studied the media, we got a more negative picture. It was not just, it was not that Europe was invisible, but that Europe tended to be treated as the other, not part of us. So what I'm wondering is whether this has changed as a result of the victory of Syriza, the anti-austerity party in Greece. And I'm going to start by asking Hara what it felt like to be in Athens during the elections. If I could say something, is that it was very exciting, the whole thing, and Syriza's victory as well, because during all those years, the years of the crisis, five years, uh, the dominant narrative about the crisis has been capitalizing on fear uh, and despair. So it was like presented like Greek people had to be punished for their past or for their cultural uh, particularities. So people had been accustomed in a way to, to live uh, under fear. Even if we resisted that, however, fear was very much widespread within society. So. Uh, with a series of victory, it just changed a lot the way people feel. So even if people were against Syriza or were not supporting very vividly uh, what this party was uh, up to, uh, however, you could feel that people are now, you can feel now that people are more confident, more hopeful and less afraid. So that's a very uh, exciting moment. And you were also saying that people didn't really believe that yeah, that, this was that the dominant parties who had ruled Greece for so long would ever yeah. leave. This has to do with uh, also what you've been uh, writing in the report, that the, the, the crisis has been presented like a supernatural phenomenon, like a cultural, in a cultural way, you know, like yeah. it was a cultural thing that Greeks were to be blamed for being lazy. And so the, the roots and the causes of the crisis have been uh, neglected in this way. So it was a, a, a natural phenomenon cast upon people, so this could not go away, even if it was uh, unjust, even if everybody could agree that austerity measures didn't have any positive impact and were harmful for the most vulnerable parts of society. However, it was a, a very unjust phenomenon that seemed like to last forever. So when it uh, ended, it was uh, revealing in a way. So, Vika. What about here in the UK? Uh, were people interested in the Greek elections and how did the ha activists in particular, how did they react? Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's been a very interesting year. Um, and just thinking of, of the Greek elections, I think there 
wasn't that much talk before the elections, but as soon as the election happened, suddenly everyone was talking about Syriza. Um, but it's been a year in which we've seen the rise of Podemos, we've seen uh, what happened in Scotland, a grassroots organizing, transforming into like quite a, a strong political statement, uh, and now Syriza. Um, and so both in the sort of activist networks, the radical left, some of the more radical NGOs, these moments have become incredibly inspiring. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, interest in understanding how this happened mm -hmm. uh, and to try to learn from, from these experiences to see what actually could be done in the, in the UK. And I think it comes in a moment in which there has been a lot of frustration of like, uh, we've been saying that austerity doesn't work. And with, but nothing is changing, and suddenly, in other countries, things start to change, and there's a you 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 see hope in other countries, and you want to understand how you can bring that hope uh, to your own country. That it became evident that there was like a crisis of agency, that people felt totally impotent and unable to not to control, but even to to understand what was happening in their lives. So if there is a victory. It's already there that you know people felt a bit more uh, engaged into politics. So I think this is if what you're saying yes, yes. happened. I think it's all over Europe. It's a mm. it's a sense of agency again. Another phenomenon that I found very interesting is um, solidarity, and so there was a call for solidarity with Greece. I think last week, mm -hmm. and I've never seen such a participation in like protests to just go out and show solidarity to another country. And I find that very interesting uh, in the way that we, we connect and we, like, we feel that we're, there's something in common between us and so we go out and mm -hmm. to show support to, to the people of another country. So does that feeling of solidarity connect <coughs> with starting to think about Europe? Definitely. I would say it, in, in the circles that I'm part of, there's a sense of we're the same people, so a real connection with the people of the other country, but not with the institutions of that country. And the same sense of like, we're, we, a lot of people don't feel that our national institutions represent us, just the same here in the UK as in Greece, but at the same time at a European level, that we don't feel that the, the European institutions represent the people. And so the solidarity happens more at a sort of horizontal level than recognizing that there's an institution that we're connected to. Solidarity is also a very uh, structural, fundamental uh, factor of the change that just took place in Greece. And I also agree with Vika about uh, Europe and about the new understanding of Europe that emerged at the moment. Because in my understanding, a citizen's victory is a rapture in terms of, you know, it became like a frame through which different people can uh, articulate their grievances and their hopes for the future. And it would be a very good perspective if this kind of rapture can create political spaces where people can live and work together without much fear or much tiredness and... Uh, Across Europe, you yeah, mean? Yeah. And are there discussions about, you know, what political changes, either at European level or national level, people would like to see? There's definitely a consciousness that there needs to be a European level of the struggle. Uh, and I think where that has become like most evident has been in the anti-TTIP movement, mm. where actually there has been a very strong European co coordination and also a, a real attempt to work on all different levels, so to interact with the institutions as much as possible while building also a grassroots movement. Gosh, what is anti-TTIP? So TTIP is a big uh, trade agreement that between the EU oh. and, and the US. And what was interesting was that there was actually a, a request uh, to actually bring it to the European Parliament and have a day in which uh, it would <coughs> be discussed. And to do this, you needed to collect um, signatures across Europe. Uh, the European Union didn't allow this, and so the grassroots and the NGOs and some of the radical parties decided to create a, a petition and they managed to reach mil a million signatures. Uh, so it's this sort of um, 
attempt to use the institutional bodies to get the voice of the people heard and when it doesn't happen then you organize your own structures which is something that I think also happened in Greece with the water referendum mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to but that's also that. made possible by the EU institutions oddly enough isn't it do you think this changed mood has affected the way the crisis is represented in the media as we also said in the report about the subterranean European politics, media in Greece has been uh, dominated by uh, political and business interests, so it has been pro-memorandum throughout those years. So it hasn't changed radically overnight. Yeah. So still, the m most media still uh, make Syriza and the grassroots movement apologize for the shift. Uh, however, they do reflect this changed mood uh, in the country. What I find a bit problematic is that it has been uh, presented a bit like uh, the rebel uh, young, uh, the rebel Greeks uh, resisting austerity. So this could be like the other side of the coin. So once you had, at the very beginning you had like the lazy Greeks, uh, the corrupted and lazy Greeks that have been transformed now from uh, the, 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 the main causes of the crisis to the main victims. So. It's, from my perspective, uh, what is wrong about that? It has been that it has been represented like an individual thing, which is like a more collective result. It's not the th it's not a result of Syriza or Tsipras or Varoufakis. It has been a change uh, caused by collectives of people resisting what was happening. So this would be something I would really like to see in how the media represent what's happening to capture this change mood that also responds to what happens in other countries like you said before, we can. Do you think that the, it, it, the UK or the European media has changed? Yes, I think, um, again, before the elections, very little was written about Greece, except for the sort of stereotypes. Mm. <laughs> um, and the fact that the, the uh, mainstream discourse is being challenged by a legitimately elected government now is forcing people to question the, the main discourse. Mm -hmm. And so it's forcing, it's, it's also opening up space for uh, journalists to be able to write about mm -hmm. different opinions on it and providing data in a different way. Um, so I think just the fact that there's a multiplicity of voices at the moment writing about the Greek crisis is al allowing us to challenge uh, the discourse that also at an international level and not only uh, relating it to Greece. Mm. So in fact what's happened is that the election of Syriza really does open up a new opportunity and it could be that the Greeks will eventually be uh, represented as heroes having uh, caused a turning point in austerity policies although we're not there yet. Um, the thing is still being negotiating, there is still an enormous amount of um, uh, conservatism among the European elite. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we also see as long as polarisation and precariousness continues, the rise of some of these other types of parties that are right-wing and xenophobic. So. To finish, I'd really like to ask you both, what are your fears and hopes for the coming period? I think it's a really very, very exciting moment. Um, but my, I would say my biggest fear is that we put too much hope <laughs> in uh, these new political parties um, and that we don't um, acknowledge that it's, it's a structural problem of the system and that there's only a certain amount of power that a political party has to change it uh, on one side and so that the, the changes that have to happen within the institutions are very very big but also that um, that they have as you were saying before grown out of like um, social movements that have started to bring uh, build at a local level some very interesting alternatives are you saying solidarity itself is a new structure and that there, that we don't fall in the trap of saying well now there's the political party and we don't need we need to stop we don't need to continue that work 
Um, so yeah, I just I think it's a very interesting moment, but it shouldn't be all put in the hands of the political parties, but also that if they fail, which is very, very likely, that that's not the only thing that we're counting on. But yeah. that there's a lot of other things that are bringing us mm. hope. I also agree with Vika that uh, this electoral victory is not per se a shift if it's not related to actual dynamics within uh, society and how people uh, live their daily lives and their relationships with their uh, fellows. Uh, as to my fears, I think that if European Un the way the European Union is perceived still uh, still functions as a way of reducing everything to market forces like we kind of understand now public and social life. This leaves much space to actually the anti-Europeanists, so to the Golden Dawn or other uh, neo-Nazi or xenophobic movements to rise up. So these allegedly pro-European forces actually uh, allow for anti-Europeanism to uh, emerge. That's how I see it. As for my hopes, I think that what can be really uh, important uh, with this uh, series of victory, with this shift, is to have this rupture I mentioned also before. So to have all these different emerging voices that are anti-austerity, uh, to, to have more than the status of opposition and to be more creative instead of just uh, criticizing or challenging. So if you have that, then you can find open political spaces of solidarity to create a new way of living instead of just being in this kind of polarized opposition to austerity. I think this is a very much important. I agree very much with both of you. I mean, I think that when political parties win, very often their main effect is not so much the policies they introduce as the fact that they legitimize certain tendencies in society. So this is a beginning, not an end. I also think if it was a turning point in attitudes towards austerity policy, attitudes towards uh, regulation, free markets, this could be tremendously important. But if it fails to do, and if parties like Syriza or Podemos get discredited, then it's terribly, terribly dangerous. Maybe not, because if you've lived, I think, and sorry for interrupting you, if you've lived through this moment where you realize that you're not isolated, but there are other forces around you that can collaborate and can yeah. agree and you can build something together, this is a revealing moment, I think, for many people to escape this kind of fear, subordination and despair and feel that they can coexist with others. So I think we shouldn't capitalize so much on, you know, one political party's victory or not, and instead emphasize on this you know, rupture in political space that is emerging. So maybe this will make us, you know, make use in a better way. Well, well I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>